Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar on inequitable climate, hurricanes, flooding, and vulnerable communities. Before addressing the main topic, I want to start with Stanford's land acknowledgement. Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. This is the second of a new series of webinars examining how climate change driven extreme events exacerbate inequality. I'm excited that we'll be joined today by Congresswoman Nancy Mace, Jennifer Gerardo, Morgan O'Neill, and Elliot White. I'm Chris Field, Director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, the organizer for today's event. The Woods Institute has been for nearly 20 years Stanford's marquee investment in advancing understanding and developing practical solutions to our era's pressing environmental problems. Woods scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to address challenges in climate, health, food, water, oceans, and biodiversity. Looking forward, we in the Woods Institute are excited to be working with colleagues from across the university as a founding pillar in the bold new Stanford Door School of Sustainability, which was officially launched on September 1st. Progress on the new school is breathtaking, and we can't wait to welcome returning students next week. Today's session is our second webinar on climate-related extreme events and inequality. After today, our next event will be on wildfires on October 27th. Please check the Woods website for information on upcoming events related to climate sustainability. In the United States, hurricanes are by far the costliest of the environmental extremes. The cost of 2005, 2005 Hurricane Katrina is estimated at $186 billion. The top five extremes in terms of cost were all hurricanes, including Harvey in 2017, Maria in 2017, Sandy in 2012, and Irma in 2017. We know a lot about the way that climate change alters risks from hurricanes, with flooding exacerbated by higher sea levels, a greater fraction of the storms reaching the most dangerous intensities, and greater rainfall totals supported by warmer air and water temperatures. Just this week, the experience of Puerto Rico with Hurricane Fiona dramatically underscores the potential for damage in areas that were still recovering from Hurricane Maria five years ago. Fiona also underscores the greater threats to the most vulnerable, where options and backup systems for transportation, electricity, fresh water, sanitation, and public health are most limited. These are risks that we need to do a better job of managing, and that's what we'll focus on today. Um, for perspective on managing the risks, I'm thrilled that we can begin today's webinar with comments from Congresswoman Nancy Mace, representing the state of South Carolina. That'll be followed by a discussion with a panel of experts on diverse aspects of hurricane physics and impacts, as well as preparation and management. Congresswoman Nancy Mace was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2020. She serves on the House Committees on Transportation and Infrastructure, Oversight and Reform, and Veterans Affairs. She's active in a number of caucuses, including the Conservative Climate Caucus. Congresswoman Mace grew up in the South Carolina Low Country. She was the first woman to graduate from the Corps of Cadets of the Citadel, the Military College of South Carolina, and she earned a master's degree from the University of Georgia. Congresswoman Mace is a fiscally conservative pro-conservation lawmaker. She has a 100% record of voting to lower taxes and a 100% rating with conservation voters of South Carolina. Congresswoman Mace, we're honored to have you join us today. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be with you all this afternoon. I represent South Carolina's first congressional district, which is the bottom half of South Carolina's coast, basically. My district is almost entirely a coastal region and climate issues, the environment, uh, green energy, all those things are very important to the area where I represent, where we have seen um, sea level rise and the impact it has on our communities um, throughout the coast. And part of my district, part of downtown Charleston, South Carolina, not only do we have sea level rise, but also part of the downtown area was built on landfills. So we have sea level rise and the issues that come with it. And then, you know, it, the city is also sinking because it was built on trash basically in certain parts. And so that uh, 
doubles down on the issues that we have when it comes to flooding or environmental natural disasters, hurricanes. We're on the heels of the 33rd anniversary of Hurricane Hugo, which hit South Carolina's coast, Charleston specifically in 1989. And I'm a freshman member of Congress. I am a Republican. I am conservative but I also am a believer in climate issues, climate change. I was one of the co-founders of the Conservative Climate Caucus. There were about 50 of us. Uh, and I recently co-founded a bipartisan natural disaster and preparedness and recovery caucus up here to ensure that, that we are prepared for the inevitable. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And even though this has been a fairly quiet year, Puerto Rico just got hit and as you uh, rightly explained earlier they're still re re you know reeling from uh, another storm from five years ago and we do see when these storms hit these major storms hit they exponentially affect communities that are poor getting access to fema funds has always been an issue as well i'm, I'm i do i'm doing legislation and what i can on climate and trying to find bipartisan solutions that are very important because I know in my own, and even though I am a Republican, in my own district, climate is an issue, the environment's an issue. Um, all of those things affect our economy because our economy is really predicated on a very strong tourist market where we need to have clean air, we need to have clean water, we need to ensure that, uh, that the environment is beautiful, our beaches are beautiful, um, and that we keep those things clean. And you know, when it comes to equality in the environment and climate, we do see that there is great disparity, whether that is access to capital in terms of uh, prep preparing for storms or access to FEMA funds, for example, after the storms have hit and getting those funds to communities uh, that aren't, that don't otherwise e are easily accessible to it. So not only is, is capital a problem, for many of those communities. But then, you know, another example I can share too is that in Charleston, they're looking at, they've been looking at the Netherlands and other countries around the world that have used seawalls, for example, when there's been sea level rise and mitigating those risk factors with a seawall. Um, and one of the issues that came up early in that process before I ever came to Congress was when they were looking at where the seawall would go, some, uh, poor community section eight housing were excluded from that area geographically on the map. And that was very early on and that has since been um, adjudicated and, and ironed out and worked out. You know, one of the things I, when I've met with people when I first was sworn into office about a year and a half ago is just making sure that the maps that they're putting forward as options for the community, if they decide to move forward with that seawall as an option that they are, we're making sure that we're included all the communities rich and poor, black and white, that they are also um, included in that. Because where I grew up in South Carolina, rich and poor is oftentimes literally black and white. And so as a conservative, I feel like it's very important for me personally to make sure that I'm looking out for disadvantaged communities. We haven't historically done a very good job of that. Our party hasn't. And um, you know, trying to make sure that we are inclusive when we're looking at environmental policy and we're looking at uh, the changes that we need to make to to fight climate change, that's really important. And, um, you know, it's been an eye opener and, and getting around and looking and listening to stakeholders as well, making sure that communities, rich and poor, black and white, that they all have access to uh, and that ability to have their voices heard, particularly when there are public comment periods. I think it's really important that we double down on those communities, make sure that they know and understand how their voices can be heard and how to make sure that uh, they're working together with stakeholders. And one of the things that I learned too, as a freshman member of Congress, is that sometimes we're the glue that just keeps things together um, and that's how we can move forward. And so, and recognizing that we make a lot of effort. We have monthly and quarterly meetings with stakeholders. They could be elected officials, they could be community leaders, making sure that we're all on the same page, that we know what's going on in our communities, where uh, grant funding is needed uh, in, in poor communities, that everyone knows what funding and what resources are available uh, to them and getting the word out that when there's a public comment period that everyone can go in um, and have their voices heard and working with leaders on both sides of the aisle, which is not necessarily very easy to do right now, 
but also I'm um, trying to change the paradigm and how we communicate and how we talk with one another. For example, I was on uh, network news last night on Fox News with uh, Ro Khanna. Some of you might be aware of know who that is, but um, I work with anyone who's willing to work with me on a number of issues. And so Ro and I, he's progressive, I'm conservative. It's just That's just an example of how we've been able to work together. Another bill that I want to mention, I worked on with Congressman Tom Rice, also out of South Carolina, uh, looking for answers from FEMA and why it's taken so long for citizens uh, to get access to emergency relief funds when storms have hit, particularly to the poorest in our communities that have that enormous need. And so um, other things that I've worked on in the community on from an environmental perspective too, uh, one of the very first projects that I uh, was able to spearhead and get completed was this small little island. It serves as a barrier island. It serves as a uh, wildlife habitat. It was a man-made, it was built, it was like 50 or 60 acres 50 years ago. And obviously with sea level rise, rise with the storms, uh, it had dissipated away. And one of the first lessons I learned as a member of Congress is that there's a huge gap in communication between the federal government, state and local governments, and then all the stakeholders. And when there's disagreement, nobody wants to talk to the other because there's so much anger. And so really being the glue that brings people together uh, talking with the stakeholders individually, then bringing everybody together in a room a couple of times. We got that deal where we refurbished the island to give, give it an environmental habitat. It serves as a barrier during storms, combat sea level rise, et cetera. It's now 60 acres with uh, very clean, non-toxic dredge soil materials, protects the town nearby, protects the shrimpers uh, and the, uh, the folks that, uh, that rely on commercial fishing, which is often some of the poor communities in our area as well. Um, but we got that deal done in about 12 weeks. And they, the state, the feds, Army Corps of Engineers, the town, they've been working on it for almost 12 years. And we got a deal done in 12 weeks and it was finally finished last year within you know, nine months of baking out that deal, making sure everybody was happy. And so I really see the role of Congress, regardless of what side of the aisle that you're on, is uh, we can be the most successful when we're communicating with all sides, even when we disagree, our goals are the same, but how we approach an issue and our paths to achieving that end goal will sometimes vary. And then sometimes it won't. And about, you know, half the time, you know, we work with Democrats all the time on all sorts of issues. And that is rare. Uh, there, it's sort of, you have this like unicorn hat that you wear because it's such a rare thing right now politically. But for the environment, I believe so much in the cause. I believe it's very important to protect our future for our kids. Um, I'm a very active voice on these issues and making sure that our stakeholders, that companies large and small, that everybody is participating in making our environment a much better place for everybody, no matter your zip code, no, ma no matter the color of your skin, that we are inclusive and that we take special care to pay attention to those communities that have the greatest needs because they're the ones that are often left behind. They're the ones that are the last to recover and those are the ones that we should be the first to help. So with that, I'm happy to uh, also take a few questions if we have a few minutes. Yeah, now. thank you so much, Congresswoman Mays, for a really inspirational uh, perspective. There is one question from the audience, Asset, that builds on a theme that you've just been discussing. This one's from Judith Schwartz, and she writes, addressing climate impact seems like it should be a bipartisan opportunity. What can Republicans do to get their leadership in Congress to be more supportive of the kinds of issues you're describing? Well, we need voices on our side of the aisle to be more vocal. So one of the first meetings I ever had after I was sworn in, I went down to Paris Island. Now, GASP, Paris Island and DOD and the Pentagon have some of the most innovative resiliency systems I have seen anywhere. And so I visited Paris Island because we've seen over the last 30 years, we've seen sea level rise affecting uh, readiness and training and the environment down there in the marshes along the coast and how they are combating climate issues and climate change. And what I saw there, um, the solar farms, the utilities, the energy creation that they can do, they're really self-sustaining down there. I saw, I traveled along a roadbed that they had raised by two feet using a special form of gravel that they had uh, innovated to use to raise the roadbed by two feet. They did it uh, under budget and on time, um, seeing the way that they are uh, renovating their buildings down there to account for the environmental factors, the, the heavier storms that are coming through, the greater rainfall we're having year after year. And in fact, I mean, usually it rains like 
really a nonstop 40 days a year. Well, the month of August, it felt like 40 days of rain along the coast of South Carolina for whatever reason this year, we've had a tremendous amount of rain. And when it rains, it floods. And so, uh, but understanding, you know, they have Tesla batteries that they use that they can generate and store some of their energy. It was really an eye opener for me to see a, a bureaucracy, uh, you know, an agency, you think of DOD and Pentagon being very bureaucratic and they are, but seeing them innovate on resiliency and environmental issues was truly eye-opening. And so I'm encouraging people to, to take a tour of what they've been able to accomplish and, and see those examples. It's just so important that, um, that we have those voices heard. And I'm trying to share with as many of my colleagues as possible. I helped found that conservative climate caucus, there were 50 of us. But as Republicans, you know, we've got to show that we are solution driven. And when we say free market environmental policy, well, what the heck does that mean, <laughs> right? Um, and I can talk about it from my perspective because my entire district is predicated on a strong tourist economy. If we don't have tourism, we don't have an economy. And tourism is making sure that our live oak trees are there forever, that we have clean water, clean air, clean beaches, that we have beach renourishment projects, um, that we work on all those. Uh, infrastructure funding is very important as well, but we just did the WERDA bill, the Water Resources Development Act. In generally speaking, members of Congress are limited to three projects that they're allowed to submit. I submitted 14, because I have so many environmental issues and things we've got to address, flooding, drainage, and looking at uh, some of the more rural areas where we have poor communities and getting them funding for stormwater drainage. We made sure they were a part of that funding as well. And we got over $100 million in funding for nine different projects. And, and so um, we've been really thoughtful about what communities we include um, and making sure we're fair to all those, no matter if it's a Democrat or Republican area, it doesn't matter. We wanna be an equal opportunist when it comes to finding resources and funding for the flooding that we're all facing because that is a bipartisan issue. Storms are not partisan. Thank you so much for your leadership on this issue. We're going to broaden the conversation now and bring in some additional experts. Congresswoman Mace, if you can stay with us, that would be terrific. Uh, for the next segment, we'll turn to three experts in hurricane research and real world responses. Jennifer Gerardo is Broward County, Florida's Chief Resilience Officer and Director of the Environmental Planning and Community Resilience Division. She oversees countywide climate resiliency initiatives, water resource policy and planning, environmental monitoring, shoreline protection, and marine resources programs. Jennifer has been a key figure in advancing multi-jurisdictional initiatives with a focus on sustainable water resource management and planning for sea level rise. Her work emphasizes holistic adaptation. Jennifer played a lead role in organizing the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact, a four-county collaboration focused on regional climate mitigation and adaptation strategies. She holds a PhD in marine biology and fisheries from the University of Miami. Morgan O'Neill is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth System Science in the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and a center fellow in the Woods Institute for the Environment. Her current research concerns severe weather in a warming world with a focus on the worst storms on Earth, tropical cyclones and supercell thunderstorms. Morgan's research emphasizes separating the physics that are fundamental to extreme events from extra features that vary with climate. She's also used tropical meteorology theory to uh, understand giant planet dynamics. Morgan holds a PhD in atmospheric science from MIT. And finally, Elliot White is an assistant professor of earth system science in the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and a center fellow in the Woods Institute for the Environment. He's a coastal ecosystem scientist with studies that emphasize the effects of saltwater intrusion and sea level rise on coastal vegetation and on humans living in the coastal zone. Elliot's interdisciplinary approach draws from ecology, hydrology, biogeochemistry, and remote sensing. He holds a PhD in environmental engineering sciences from the University of Florida. The format for the next segment of today's webinar is that I'll start with a few questions. After about 15 minutes, we'll get to the good part, questions from all of you in the audience. If you get a question into the queue, type it at any time into the Q&A box using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can, and after the conversation, we'll draft answers to any unanswered questions and post them on the Woods website. Let me start out with a question for Morgan. We know that climate change influences hurricanes, but I don't think people have a 
really good sense of the mechanisms by which the climate change is altering hurricanes, how much effect of that we've already seen, and uh, what are the kinds of steps that we can think about taking to manage the way that hurricane intensity and pathways are changing? That is a, a great and complex question. And, and part of my answers will be really obvious. And then the other is I'm just going to have to throw up my hand. So, so there are some things that are robustly happening um, that we can see in the observational record. We know our average sea surface temperature is going up and that is that is the fuel for hurricanes. Um, we know that sea level is starting to rise and is going to continue to rise. And that just brings uh, storm surge, the water that hurricanes bring and push onto, onto coasts um, just up higher and in, inland farther. Um, and, and we also know that the worst storms are going to get rainier due to climate change because of some fundamental physics that just controls the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. But something like frequency, for example, we have really no theory whatsoever to, to bound in either direction. And research at the frontier suggests that hurricanes could get more frequent and other research at the same frontier suggests the opposite. Um, so, so I would say that science has, has figured out the low hanging fruit uh, between the, you know, for the relation between hurricanes and climate change. But some of these questions that people think are so, so obvious, like, you know, the changing frequency, we really, we're, we're still working hard. And it's one of the issues is the observational record is very short. We've only had global satellite coverage since about the 70s. And so it's really hard to point out uh, a strong trend even now. Um, uh, with such a short observational record, things are very noisy. The signal is starting to pop up against um, above the noise for for some variables of interest. But it, yeah, this is we need more data. We don't have. We One don't have thing that was striking to me this week about Hurricane Fiona is that even though it is, uh, I'll put it in quotes, only a Category One storm, it still delivered. 30 inches of precipitation and caused massive amounts of flooding, about the same amount of precipitation as Hurricane Maria, a Category 5 storm. And um, most of the damages from hurricanes really are associated with flooding rather than winds. I almost wonder whether we put too much focus on the, the maximum wind speed. I strongly agree with that. And actually, uh, scientists at the National Hurricane Center are working on how to communicate the, the actual deadly risks better because the, the category system, category one versus four or five, that is really just a function of the peak wind speed. And we know that you know a storm will rain more the longer it sits on one area. That's what we saw in Houston uh, during Hurricane Harvey, for example. So you're right, absolutely. Water is the killer, whether it's salt water from the ocean or it's just flooding due to fresh water from the sky. Um, and and that that's something that public messaging needs to embrace more. And and smart people are working on this. So that's why the the public you know watches and warnings are kind of a moving target every year for what you know social scientists as well as physical scientists are trying to relate to the public. Jennifer, you need to deal with the changing risks of hurricane impacts on a on a daily basis. How do you think about building the evolving? understanding from climate science into the things you do? Sure. Um, you know, our, our early work has, has really been driven by the fact that we could see sea level rise affecting our water supplies. And, um, and then in about 2012, we began to see more in the way of uh, coastal flooding associated with the fall high tides. And, um, and it didn't take long before we started to see um, you know, those impacts grow more extensive, frequent, and severe. And today, there's just no debate about um, the extent to which coastal areas are being impacted. But uh, Broward County um, in South Florida, while we, we've got about 24 miles of coast, but we have so many exposures that extend well beyond what you might consider most coastal. Um, we have a very porous geology, so we have seen our groundwater table rise as a function of sea level rise. Um, we do see the higher storm surge. We just had some work completed by FEMA in our region, and uh, unexpectedly, we saw the uh, impacts of the one to three foot storm surge set up 
extend into the far western reaches of our county clear out to the Everglades. So not at all isolated to the coastal areas. Uh, we've also been uh, modeling uh, the increase in, in rainfall. Um, we are now accounting for a 20% increase in the three-day 100-year event. And all of that information is being brought into new design standards for what we're requiring for infrastructure. Um, not only did we know that uh, current standards were outdated, but uh, their application certainly wouldn't provide out, um, effectiveness in terms of the entire design life of the infrastructure that's being um, you know, constructed today. So we now have new design requirements for stormwater management systems to account for the change in groundwater table. We have established uh, uniform uh, resilience requirements for seawall heights, berms, and other coastal infrastructure like uh, marinas that can serve as conduits for water movement into the uh, inland areas. Uh, we have adopted updated uh, flood elevations as a function of the uh, two feet of sea level rise and conditions predicted out through 2060. So we're really working to uh, now um, provide for a more comp comprehensive evaluation of flood risk through the layering of compound flood events or flood factors. And the next step that we're working on is the incorporation of storm surge on top of all of those scenarios that I just described. So we're trying to move quickly. We know that uh, the dollars spent today will um, be um, more robust in the way of projects and serve the community best if we can ensure embeddedness of resilience requirements early on. Uh, Elliot, um, Jennifer represents and works for one of the most uh, forward-looking and proactive parts of the of the Atlantic and, and Gulf Coast. Uh, I, I wonder if you could speak more broadly to the to the regional status of hurricane preparedness and and risk of impacts, looking both at the at the risk to the ecosystems and the risk to the people across the the whole geography that goes from. Of Texas through Virginia. Yeah, thanks for the question, Chris. Uh, so I've lived across that uh, entire area from Texas through Florida up to Virginia. Uh, and I would say most coastal communities, uh, the municipalities are doing a lot of work to better prepare their citizens for Im impending hurricanes, which are surely to happen in certain places. Uh, I think on the environment side, there's still a lot of attention that is lost, uh, particularly as we think about building out coastal defenses. We often think of hardened infrastructure like levees, seawalls, things like that. And we often don't think about kind of the green infrastructure that wetlands represent. Uh, wetlands do a lot of the dirty work at kind of reducing storm surge and uh, taking away some of the impact of hurricanes. But I don't think there's as much work being done to help with conservation and revitalization of these wetlands across the, north, across the Northern Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic coast. Uh, and with that, we're losing a lot of coastal defense. And oftentimes, cities, states, regions aren't really aware of the fact that they're losing all of that uh, coastal defense that we don't actively have to pay for. And so I think communicating more with citizens to get them on board with uh, more coastal protection, not just in the way of save the environment, but also like this is part of our, our states, our city's defense plan. And hopefully, uh, by connecting with communities and getting them to be invested in those type of strategies, we can have an overall improvement in our coastal environment, which will obviously have feedbacks on protecting more people overall. And maybe Jennifer, you could follow up on Elliot's comment about the, the value of um, nature-based defenses and, and how you think about incorporating nature-based defenses into the broader strategy that you need to deploy to protect Broward County? Yeah, I'm going to admit that um, our community is, it, you know, it's difficult. We do have a very large, um, you know, coastal uh, mangrove area, um, but we also have um, several hundred miles of seawalls that are part of um, kind of like finger canals along uh, most of our coast. Um, and then we have our beaches. So um, clearly, you know, we're we're acknowledging and have acknowledged that you know beaches are critical to protecting coastal infrastructure. They're also core to our economy, and it's going to be very difficult to um, preserve economic activity to continue to invest in resilience if you had a decay of your uh, entire tourist-based 
um, economy as a function of beach loss. Um, at the same time, we have um, coral reefs that are offshore that are the first line of defense to storm surge, and beach projects are not the most um, in historically, the practice has been that some of those projects have uh, resulted in impacts that have uh, eroded, you know, significant uh, st stretches of our of our coral reef. So the, the the needs today, I think, are one focused on uh, larger integration of beach dunes into our beach profile. In fact, we won't build projects today that don't include extensive. Um, uh, dune uh, components, and we have a target for 80% of our shoreline to have established sand dunes. Um, we are very involved in uh, beach management strategies that use very high quality sand and reduce the potential for mobilization in order to protect what we do have of our reef track. And so those projects have to be very carefully managed. And um, and, and we certainly don't want to see any uh, compromise of a, a reef track that's already in a very poor state. So there's a lot of research and concentration conservation activities associated with that today. I think that there are dramatic opportunities to improve our sea walls that but probably not going anywhere for some time by including biological forms and different features that can uh, provide recruitment area for um, you know different types of es established habitat to create biological value in the seawalls where we don't have them today. They're a very sterile environment. And um, you know a lot of the mitigation work that happens, we're a totally built out com uh, community. I mean, we are 100% urbanized outside of the Everglades and the water conservation there is. So one of our um, principal strategies moving forward is that we think as we think about stormwater management in the inland area, we really need to be enhancing green infrastructure. We have a lot of older areas that just don't reflect the types of features that we know to provide um, best performance for water quality management, treatment, habitat value, cooling of urban island effect, heat island effects within the community. So we're very much coupling uh, issues of heat and water management as we look at preferred strategies moving forward with an optimization of green infrastructure, which will hopefully provide um, many urban enhancements. But I'll admit in terms of near shore, like oyster reefs and so forth, I feel that we don't necessarily have the same uh, opportunities as some of our uh, neighboring counties by virtue of how uh, we've developed historically. Morgan, as somebody who thinks about the physics of how hurricanes form and, and where the energy is released and how climate change is, is altering their properties. Are, th are there things that you think the, um, the preparation and response community should be paying attention to that they're not? And that where, the, where from, a, from a physics perspective, you say, gee, you guys are missing the boat. I, I know some people, not many, but some people in the the community who are working on you know hazards and responses, and and I think they're doing the best they can. And I don't think there's obvious stuff that they don't know. So I, I don't have a a great answer for that. I you know the the research community has to kind of figure out the physics first, and then you know ideally we don't just push it to them. It's a conversation about how. Um, uh, how our findings can be, you know, trusted, how robust they are before, you know, something goes down the pipeline to a, a warning to the public. Um, but yeah, I would say that there's a lot of research right now looking into, for example, translation speed, you know, again, Harvey just sat and that was the problem. Mm -hmm. Harvey was not super strong. Um, we also think as a community, um, there's evidence that the, the, the region that's likely to be impacted by hurricanes is expanding poleward. And you know you can't ever point to a single event and say that's climate change, but the fact that um, Atlantic Canada right now is is under potential um, historic threat from Fiona is, is consistent with you know a future that has higher sea surface temperatures at higher latitudes. Um, but I would say that there's you know there are social scientists working on this constantly, and the National Science Foundation funds their work, and and I think that that is getting a lot of attention. And that's why the, you know, the public warnings and watches and communication is, is, is evolving so fast. So I'm actually really encouraged by how closely physical and social scientists are working together. The, the thing that strikes me as being super unusual and, and somewhat unexpected about the apparent impacts of climate change and hurricanes is this 
uh, higher and higher precipitation levels. And we had been tuned in for a long time to the idea of um, a higher sea level setting the stage for the storm surge being more damaging. But the, but the huge precipitation amounts associated with the, the hurricanes just sitting, as you say, or, or the warm water and warm air supporting vast amounts of precip really exacerbate the kind of water management problems that Jennifer has been speaking of and, and mean that, that every, all the features of that infrastructure just need to be a lot more robust and a lot more um, optimized for these massive water flows, even if they occur infrequently. Jennifer, oh, go go ahead, Elliot. Yeah, I was, I was going to kind of chime in on that. I think uh, what you what you all are pointing out about uh, a lot of emphasis on storm surge and maybe less emphasis on increased precipitation. I think it gets to a core thing: is that in some ways we're going to have to learn to live with water. And what we've been doing for so long is trying to keep water at bay, keep it from coming from the ocean and into land. But we're seeing these hurricanes that are not having significant storm surges, like Harvey. Um, with respect to Houston specifically, but still produce a lot of rainfall. And that rain ended up just getting trapped in a city where uh, oftentimes when we think about civil engineering infrastructure, it's get the water out of the landscape as fast as possible. But if that water doesn't have a proper place to go, those reservoirs, those places get backed up and then water floods the entire city. And so I think in some ways uh, we look at the Netherlands as a, we have to, keep water out, but the Netherlands also do a good job of living, living with water. And I think that's a major part of their story that we often miss. And I think we really need to incorporate that into how we deal with water, particularly in these extreme events like hurricanes. And, and would you say that even in, even in urban areas? Yeah, I, I think so. So I think uh, there's been more emphasis on including things like bioswales and other types of uh, landscape features that recognize that this is a spot where water is going to sit. So let's find a way to incorporate that into our city planning so that such that water sits here, it's not someone's house, it's not someone's front lawn. And that's a way to kind of mitigate the effects of these massive pulses of water that can come through. Jennifer, how does that fit with your plans? Well, I, I think that it's, uh, I, I absolutely agree with the comments that Elliot was making. I think we have a really uh, recent example with uh, Tropical Storm Etta that came through our community, I think about two years ago. We got about 35 inches of rain in a six week time frame. about 20 inches of that came in a three day time period. So our uh, landscape was super saturated. The groundwater level was clear up to the surface. There was no storage left in the soils. Um, and the event occurred between two sizable high tide events. And so our drainage in our community relies upon gravity for the most part. Water has to drain downhill. And if we have you know, so surge and high tides and sea level rise that are basically creating a barrier to drainage, we ended up with two weeks of two feet of floodwaters in the most western part of our community, not in the east, but in the west, because this was the last part of the system that was able to drain. And um, so, and, and we have seen with many of the tropical storms recently, we're dealing with issues of debris or rainfall, little less than in our, most immediately in our area has been extreme winds. And, you know, we've been addressing building codes to deal with extreme wind, high velocity winds in our section of, of the region for some time. But I think that a lot of the drainage infrastructure really predates today's standards. And again, wasn't designed with, with future conditions in mind. And it really requires a lot of coordination because oftentimes somebody's thinking about their system within their neighborhood community, but there's all these dependencies between interconnected systems and where they drain and discharge to and whether there's capacity in the downstream portion of the system. If the capacity is not there, the water isn't moving. And increasingly, we're seeing that the system is at capacity all the time. It's wet no matter where you look. The storage ponds are always full. And so you really you have lesser rainfall events are creating significant flooding. And then coupled with this intensification of, of rainfall events, uh, it is in incredibly disruptive. Um, we've had we had one rainfall event that resulted in the uh, closure of a commercial center to a loss of $30 million in revenues over the course of a weekend. So these are, you, you know, 
community disruptions, quality of life, livability, flood losses, and really economic hiccups that certainly can't be sustained and need to be addressed. We're getting close to the point where I want to transition to questions from the audience and a reminder that if you type your question into the Q&A box, clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, we'll have a chance to get to it. And But before I do, I, I, I want to ask all of you about um, new financial resources that are in the pipeline as a result of the bipartisan infrastructure bill or the Inflation Reduction Act. And from your perspective, your take on hurricanes, what would you most like to see those funds used for in the, in the areas that you care about? And, and I know that's a specific focus of your Jennifer, so I'll start with you on that. Um, well, we have, as I said, a, a gravity-driven drainage system. We need a lot of pumps and stormwater improvements to move water um, and create additional capacity within the system. We have hurricane evacuation routes that we've known for 20 years or 15 years that are extremely exposed to storm surge and sea level rise. Um, investments have not been made. In fact, those, pro those, those projects that are serving underserved communities um, aren't even prioritized today, even based upon the resilience considerations that we've had at hand for some time. So there's a real critical need to work with our Department of Transportation and the Metropolitan uh, Planning Organizations to take advantage of the massive funding that's coming through the Department of Transportation for resilience investments. FEMA has uh, significant programs available today, BRIC funding that can support resilience investments delivering up to, I think, $50 million per project. There's also a greater uh, partnership with FEMA on watershed planning. So this isn't you know, getting out in front of those events rather than always being in response and recovery mode. I really feel like, um, and we were having conversations today that FEMA has much more pivoted in the last several years to try and orient resource to support uh, advanced planning. And, and, and as we know, the statistics were updated just a couple of years ago, uh, $1 in, in, in advanced preparation, saving about $7 uh, relative to the cost of recovery. So I think that there's a lot of promise on the horizon. Um, Army Corps is always a you know a, a good partner but the dot money right now and fema money money seems to be some of the strongest in addition to anything that might be coming through uh cdbg dollars and and hud great thanks uh morgan i know infrastructure isn't really your thing but i but i wonder if you comment on from a, a early warning perspective what additional resources you think might be useful in terms of of giving us better prediction, better warning, better risk assessments. I, yeah, this is pretty far from my my uh, wheelhouse, but I think that the the overall use in emergencies of pushing messages to phones um, has actually been shown to be really effective, and so I think that in terms of warning people directly in an area either by you know cell tower or, or, or zip code or something about uh, some impending you know risk I think if you know simply sending a descriptive text message to to people in that area could be really valuable also I know decision makers have a lot of trouble um, not trouble it's just a very hard problem to to determine if or if um, and when an area should evacuate because evacuation also has its own risks. You know, if you if you pack the highways and no one's moving on the highway anymore, and then the hurricane hits, you know, that's going to be uh, potentially catastrophic. And, and what do you think about the prospects for improving the projections of uh, where landfall is going to occur, or whether or not there's going to be super heavy precipitation? Yeah, we're actually we're pretty good at uh, as as a field. Um, at forecasting the track. Um, but the problem is forecasting the uh, intensity and, and the structure of the storm when it is there where we were pretty sure it was going to be. And so that means that we might have a storm that we know is about to hit some major city, but we don't know in 48 hours whether it's going to be a category one or a category three. And we know even less about the rainfall totals because those are so uh, intricately entwined in, in the intensity of the storm. So, yeah, I would say that, you know, increased investment in um, supercomputing on behalf of the National Weather Service and all of the offices underneath it is, is valuable because we just see that 
you know, the better computers you have, the, the better forecasts we have. It's not just a, a human intelligence problem, although th that's really key. Forecasters are essential, but, um, you know, investing in, in, the, in the tools that we need to, to improve forecasting is, you know, never a bad idea. That mm -hmm. clearly always helps. Recognizing that the, the cost of evacuation, the risk of evacuation, and the inequality implications of evacuations are all serious issues where a better warning system could always be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. There could be tiered evacuations. There should be, you know, improved public busing. Um, there are just a lot of, there, yeah, there's a whole hierarchy of concerns and some of them are physical and, and many of them are social. Elliot, when, when, when you think about what, what you would use billions of investment dollars for, especially in this area of, of nature-based defenses, are there, are there opportunities to kind of rethink the relationship between humans and the environment that help build resilience? Yeah, I think there are. I think uh, oftentimes, which hurts my heart as an ecologist, we have to convert kind of uh, what nature does to us, for us in terms into money, in terms into financial senses. And I think when we think about wetlands in particular, they offer many, uh, can offer many financial incentives to communities, particularly low-income communities. And so when you think about these, particularly more rural areas where you have the opportunity to conserve and, and do more restoration, those wetlands can also act as generators of income. So birds really love to hang out in wetlands. And there are a lot of migratory birds that pass from Canada to South America twice a year. And wetlands become places where those birds stop and rest their wings for a little bit. And people will travel hundreds of miles to come and see certain bird species. So you could, if you get into that conservation area, you are basically generating paths of income because people will come to your community, spend money in your hotels, your restaurants, because they really love birding. The same thing for sports fishing. So Louisiana builds itself as sportsman paradise. And part of that is because you can go hunting in the swamps for deer. You can also hop on a boat in the afternoon and go fishing. And so uh, wetlands also provide that nursery habitat that many aquatic species, particularly marine species use for the early stages of their life. And so this money from the government could, should, could and should be seized on by these communities to not only help build up their coast protection in a more green way, but also build up their local economy in a green way as well, which, uh, like I said, building off the things that these natural ecosystems provide to us and, the, and just monetizing them. Uh, so I think that's, that's a real strong way that we can think about nature-based solutions as not just uh, kind of cheaper ways to protect our environment, but ways to also generate income that no one's going to pay to go see a, uh, a levy, really, but people will, people will spend money to come to your town and, and see a, a bird that they've been looking for for 20 years. So how to integrate um, tourist economy, nature-based economy with resilience is going to be a key priority. Mm -hmm. Let me turn now to, to questions, and there are a whole bunch of great questions in the Q&A box. We'll get to as many as we can. Let me start with one from uh, Mac and along. This one's for Jennifer. How, how's Broward County incorporating new private development into resilience planning and adaptation projects? And can we leverage private funding and resources for public shorelines? Well, there are a lot of, um, I think, elements to that question. Uh, I will admit that a lot of the work to date in terms of provide private development has been focused more on what I might call commercial development and ensuring resilience requirements as part of um, uh, any uh, land use planning um, considerations and uh, seeking confirmations from the municipalities about uh, compatible resilient infrastructure uh, planning that would be needed in order to support uh, any projects because you know projects on their own aren't sufficient. You need all the uh, adjacent or associated infrastructure to be able to, to serve these areas. I think one of the, when we look at more uh, issues about um, you know, individual uh, residential properties, I don't feel that we're um, particularly well positioned to address that question uh, at all right now. I think that we are going to be looking, we're um, undertaking a, a, a countywide resilience plan and we will be looking at water management needs on a 50 acre sub basin under these compound flood uh, scenarios. 
And we expect with that, we'll be looking at changes in water management, changes in infrastructure, um, things like distributed water storage, again, such as Elliot had mentioned. I think that we're going to find that a lot of the on-site storage that we've typically required on a parcel by parcel basis may not be able to be met under future conditions. And we may need to look at shared infrastructure as a strategy for meeting that. You know, when we've looked at issues of um, uh, elevating homes, we're all slab on grade in, in Broward County. And that's, um, you know, probably a minimum $100,000 for uh, a standard home. And uh, I, I would venture to say probably not very realistic. The other issues that we have are that of uh, private seawalls. And uh, as we've built into our regulations, we've required, we've established uh, tidal flooding as a public nuisance. And we've uh, required that if there are upgrades being made to um, uh, a property, um, or uh, if there's re if a, a new installation, or if there if a property is cited as the source of tidal flooding that is contributing to uh, flooding of a right of way, there's requirements to bring that infrastructure up to standard within the next 12 months. Now. For some, that's a sizable investment, and that may be one that's difficult to afford. Um, but so are roofs. Um, you know, we it, it, ownership has requirements, and the seawalls, whether they're um, being upgraded in response to the resilient standard because of flooding or future collapse, ultimately those investments are going to need to be made. Our concern is making sure that when they're made, that there's consistency and we can have a defined level of service that comes with those improvements. We have been exploring things such as um, alternative finance mechanisms to help support residents um, in these investments. And, and frankly, to date, there hasn't been uh, a very strong response by the financial uh, partners in the community to uh, extend uh, finances in a manner that helps with those types of projects. But we are also expecting that as demands increase, uh, that there may be um, new overlay districts and other strategies whereby we might be able to look for some uh, scales of economy by finding financial mechanisms that can help communities work together where there is a uh, an individual cost involved and maybe utilizing you know, tax assessments and so forth as ways to help uh, provide for the longer term management of those costs. But those are significant, just like you know, the expenses of connecting to sanitary sewer, which has been you know, a, a difficult thing for many communities to bear. So there's a lot of financial needs today. Hopefully we will see more in the way of grants that can be made ava available through state and federal governments to help provide cost share, especially where we have lower income individuals who are really needing some assistance in order to be able to stay in their homes, because that's the other concern is you don't just abandon a property and then find new real estate in an area where property values are through the roof. And we're very uh, concerned about affordability of homes, um, insurance, the availability of insurance. And it's really critical that we find resilient strategies and funding mechanisms that allow people to continue to, to stay in residences to the extent that we can effectively address flood risk. Right. Yeah. Let's move from uh, the, the finances to awareness. And this question for Morgan and from Caroline Emery, what recommendations do you have for raising awareness and money for this cause at the local level? Everyone seems to express concern, but how do you get them to invest in science they can't see until it's too late? And that person concludes, I'm in Sarasota, Florida. Hi, Caroline. Um, so I would actually... I would push back a bit on the framing. Um, you, you suggest trying to raise awareness at the local level, which I think is essential and, and wonderful and always urgent, um, but also money. And I don't think money at the local level can, can do anything other than perhaps at the local level. But if, if we're talking about changing infrastructure, if we're talking about um, improving forecasts or, or you know building gates and seawalls and those sorts of things, the, those need policy levers to be pulled to make happen. They're just too expensive for a, a community to, to pitch in. And so I would actually say that awareness at the local level is, is the absolute key piece to, to push policy um, at the, uh, I don't know, not really city, but even county, state, and definitely federal level uh, for action, because that's that's the only way to to improve infrastructure, whether um, social or you know warning or um, or or physical, 
Um, so, you know, yeah, you say everyone seems to express concern, but how do you get people to invest in science? I think that awareness and communication can be done by virtually anyone. I have offered a number of public free seminars at my hometown's library and welcomed my hometown neighbors to come in and learn about climate change. And, and you don't need a PhD to do that. You, you just need to you know, read a couple books and then you're a resource for your community. So I think that that sort of, that sort of um, action is, you know, I encourage it. And, and I think that, you know, resources like public libraries are excellent places to get the community to come in and just be able to ask questions. And, you know, with a little bit of practice, anyone can answer them. And it was inspirational to hear Congresswoman Mace emphasizing the activist approach she's taking to climate impacts in South Carolina. Let me, um, let, let's go to a different aspect of, of climate responses. And uh, this one is for, uh, for Elliot from Danielle Goshen. Uh, do, do you foresee coastal retreat as likely in areas across the Gulf Coast? And how do we help shepherd a just retreat before people are forced? Are there any good models or case studies of where it's been done equitably? Yeah, that's a really great question. And it's an extremely challenging question. Uh, so there is a, a place where it's happening right now in, in Southern Louisiana uh, called Ile, Ile de Jean Charles. Uh, it's a small barrier island community and uh, was kind of the ancestral home of, of a um, uh, native population. And right now they're kind of being forcefully relocated further inland uh, toward Homa, if, if you know anything about Louisiana geography. And that has come with tremendous challenges because we oftentimes think about as a community, a neighborhood, as a physical place. It's a place on the map. You can put in an address and get there. But those things are also communities of people. And uh, not only are they communities of people with connections to one another, but they have connections to the actual physical environment. And so when we talk about relocation, we have to keep in mind that, one, you have to try and keep communities together. And ideally, you can relocate or help people relocate into places that are familiar to them or that have similarities to the things that they're used to. Uh, what's happening with Ilja John Charles is uh, there's a lot of good intention, but I think there's some poor execution. And I think that will probably happen more likely than not for the next several years until we can get it right. Uh, and, and another thing we have to think about is these people are moving somewhere else and you can't just drop them into an empty field and say, here's your new city. You're, you're most likely going to bring them into another community. So how do you integrate them into a community that they're not familiar with, a city that they're not familiar with, and maybe don't uh, give them access to the same cultural needs that they have looked for before. So uh, I'm not aware of good examples. There might be some out there, but I'm not aware of them. And I think that means that we need to really do the hard work right now of sitting down and really thinking about how do we help people relocate in these types of situations? Because it it's going to be a, an issue that is going to keep occurring. Uh, it's either going to be driven by the slow creep of sea level rise or hurricanes are just going to make a city uninhabitable for a while and people will have to relocate in that situation as well. So uh, it's something that people really are policymakers and, and communities need to seriously consider because it's not going away anytime soon. We're down to about one minute and we won't have time to get to the rest of the of the questions. I'm going to give everybody a chance for a 10 second closing thought if if there's something we missed talking about Morgan. Uh, I really enjoyed learning from this conversation. I think that all of the action is happening with um, decision makers. And so it's been a pleasure to learn from Elliot and Jennifer. Elliot? Yeah, I'll, I'll say the same. And I think we hit a lot of the important points. So I don't have much else to add. And Jennifer. Yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, resilience is going to be a long uh, standing part of the way that we think about and plan and invest in our communities. Think that communication is important, finding ways to brand and reinforce, you know, investments that are representative of resilience. It's really important for people to appreciate what infrastructure is and how it performs and supports our communities. And, um, and, and those broad communications that help build support through uh, private sector interests, not only help build endorsement for the plans, but also set up for these successful financial models that will be needed to help implement. And, and let me just close by repeating the emphasis that all of you brought that there are compelling solutions and that investments in 
building resilience almost always pay off way more than the initial cost. Thank you again to Jennifer, Morgan, Elliot. Really been a fabulous conversation. Thank you to everybody who's joined the audience and wonderful questions. And I wish we had a chance to discuss all of them even more thoroughly, but um, this is an important topic and, and we really appreciate your input. Thank you to Congresswoman Mace's staff and also to the Superb Woods Institute staff. I especially wanna thank Lee Rosenbaum, Kamaya Daniels, Molly Field, Roberta Tugenreich, and Celia Daniels. Thanks also to Evan Schwartz for video support. Thanks everybody for joining us today for a really important topic. Thank you.